First, um, I want to thank um, Free Right for inviting me here again. I think the last time I was here was 2014. Um, and definitely a shout out to, uh, to Roger. Um, I like to say we down like four flat tires. <laughs> yeah, so that's my guy. And, uh, but thank you, man, for, for thinking about me in this wonderful event tonight. And um, you know, lastly, thank all of you for coming out to hear something that I may have to say, right? Um, so let's just get started and we'll go on a sort of journey. And um, we'll start at the beginning and we'll work ourselves to some kind of conclusion. How'd that sound? Yeah. All right. Answer the phone at 10 p.m. Offer a reserve hello in a nebulous night filled with palace snow in Harlem. Respond with OK. Listen. Be attentive when you learn he died in the hell of gunfire at the intersection of Minnesota Avenue and East Capitol Street in the nation's capital. After thinking that's fucked up, thank your old college roommate for calling. Ignore that he greeted you as Hook, the nickname you went by in the street. Hang up. You can and can't believe the truth simultaneously. Write D-I-S-C-O in your leather journal. Maybe this will immortalize the image. You will never forget him, but you have already forgotten Hook. Before the blackbird's echo bangs against your windowsill, wake up. Go directly to the mahogany desk between two windows, sit in the brown swivel chair. Stare at the building opposite your building, rearrange papers that don't need rearranging twice. Open your journal to the name written last night, Disco. Remember the cell doors opening after serving 18 months for three felonies in Fairfax County Adult Detention Center. Five hours after their release, meet Disco Willing and ATM through your basement on a handcart. Out of the wall with metal chain and pickup truck, he had pulled the money machine. He did that. This is your introduction. Turn on the computer. Type Theodore Blanford in the search box. Click the magnifying glass. Expect to be surprised even though you know what the results will bring. Don't be surprised when you scroll to Maryland double homicide suspect shot killed in DC. One lone bird outside your window flies backwards at an indeterminate rate of speed while the world moves forward. The bird is red. Look for balance in the oddity. Note that double homicide is five syllables. Five deliberate pauses before, damn. Remember you knew the suspect shooter killer, <laughs> suspend court in your imagination. Add four indeterminate words to formulate the phrase, hold court in the streets. This is how he would die, holding court in the streets, prophetic. After reading that the now deceased wife had wanted a divorce, deduced it was because of drugs. Visualize the wife and sister just before death in their double wide. Try to make sense of the blood spilled on the carpet. The red is deafening scream. Wait for the buzz to stop. Excuse me. Wait for the buzz to stop because someone has rung the wrong buzzer. There's always an echo after the buzzing. Even after it buzzes again, do not answer. It is not for you. Keep reading the online article, but more specifically the phrases forcible entry and protective order. Acknowledge that your friend was a suspect in his first wife murder too, a dead body in the trunk. Two days later, while driving to school, the teach called short man because it takes that long to find someone to talk about tragedy. Tell short man who is a barber and has 10 years behind razor wire tucked in his memory what happened. Agree in unison that prison will turn the brain into a hum. Agree again that prison taught you to be a better criminal though you both digress. Both of you understand the term anomaly, but admit that disco was a composite of many men who never learned to be a man. You would then ask yourself the question for the first time, why? Return back home from New Haven before rush hour traffic begins to bottleneck the Cross County Parkway. Dig through the closet for the first version of your memoir. Disco rolled the safe out of the department store. The first lines of the paragraph read, Go to the next page where he loved to pull the trigger of a gun more than, the than he loved touching the torso of a woman. Flip to the page where he and his sister distributed lead bullets through the windshield and the impressions of circular holes when the discarded pierces the glass are swift and pronounced. The body is a question mark. He tried to run over the wife 
with a truck and then threatened her with a claw hammer, she told the police. Ask yourself why this sign didn't signify violence. What theory would Ferdinand de Saussure classify this under? Put the manuscript back in the closet. Don't beat yourself up because you knew he was a killer and said nothing to nobody. Forget the double negative your mom would correct you on and tell yourself it's nature versus nurture. Justify your silence in saying the world that you once lived in was filled with silence and mayhem. That is why they called you Hook. Don't block Audre Lois. Your silence will not protect you from your mind. Pretend this is penance. Wake up the next morning. Go back to the computer. Press any key to erase the black screen. Ignore the blackbirds outside your window while telling yourself this is the last time. You need to forget, but before you do one more search, click inmate violent death in the news. A flutter of blackbirds appears suspended in animation at the top right corner of the web page. Ignore them, but then don't. Tell yourself this is not karma, Edgar Allan Poe style. He did not want her to leave. She wanted him to go. Said he needed treatment. Think back to 12-step literature that cautions about the 13th step, sexual fraternization with people inside the circle. Feel confident in assuming that she was a recovering addict and understood addictive behavior. Two addicts don't make a right. Tell yourself this. Read about the interaction with police who failed to notice the inevitable. Admit the judicial system is failing to protect women. I am victim was tattooed on her forehead, yet she remained invisible to the patriarchs, the ones sworn to protect and serve. Ask yourself, does his death matter more than the victim's death? Convince yourself the race never stops running, that memory will eat your ass alive. Say, I am a changed man, but no one will hear you. Get back in the bed. Pull the covers over your face. Remember the dream. Forget Hook. Wake up tomorrow and feel guilty all over again. All right. And so, and so the passage that I read you um, was from my memoir, um, and it's called Hook. And it sort of chronicles um, a lot of the sort of things interactions that brought me to incarceration um, in the, the late 90s. Um, I went through a, you know, I went through the, I guess you want to call the war on drugs in the 80s. Um, and I became part of that sort of national narrative of, 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 of the sort of, you know, sort of exp the expansion of the prison industrial complex, for lack of a better word. Um, and the culmination of it sort of ended with me um, being incarcerated with um, seven felony convictions um, and 10 years in Maryland and five back up in Virginia. Um, so I was looking at 15. And what happened was um, Maryland, well, two things. I was in a program um, in, in county jail that was called Jail Addiction Services, um, which allowed me to meet a, a woman named Bonnie Boswell um, who was starting to rethink about what it meant to be incarcerated and was, off, was trying to get guys who were on the inside into a program in North Carolina as an alternative to incarceration. So um, after five years, uh, even before then, when I got my time, uh, my lawyer put in for what they call a motion for reconsideration of sentence. Um, and there's not a lot of states that do that, but Maryland is one of those states. Um, and so I actually put it in and got granted another court date uh, after five years. Um, and, and based off of the plan that we had, they, they commuted my sentence and allowed me to sort of, well, I had to go to Virginia. I had some, t some stuff there. But the, anyway, the long story short, I was able to sort of re-jumpstart my life um, by going to um, North Carolina um, and completing that program and coming back and sort of facing a lot of the challenges that um, we the people who have been locked up on the inside sort of face, um, we, we, whether it be job, housing, academic challenges. I went to Howard University, um, and as an old student returning, they, were, they, they, didn't, they wouldn't allow me in because of my felony convictions, so I had, it had to end up getting my degree from the University of the District of Columbia, which I'm grateful for. Um, and I actually spent some time here uh, in Chicago, Chicago State. I got my MFA in poetry here, right, yeah. 
Uh, so it was a great time for me to be in Chicago, um, coming, you know, have, not having not just been there long from incarceration. A lot of good things happened to me here. Uh, then I was able to uh, leave here and go to uh, Albany, New York. I, I was in a PhD program um, uh, at SUNY Albany um, and, and did a critical creative dissertation, which allowed me to sort of um, be more flexible on the job market as if I was going to get a job, <laughs> you know, uh, which, uh, you know, I didn't know what it would, would happen, but um, I was able to get a job at a university, the University of New Haven, um, and it turned into a tenure track line. And um, two years ago, what's this, so 16, I became the first person in America with seven felonies to receive tenure at a university. So, I guess that's achievement, you know, I mean, but I do celebrate it. Um, <laughs> I do celebrate it. Um, I'm just trying to make sure I, I um, touch on a lot of things I want to talk about. Um, and so one of the things I want to, what has been really near and dear to my heart is so, because I, I do a lot of these, spe uh, these talks um, a lot of places and sort of like, the way we begin to even talk about incarceration, um, the criminal justice system. And um, I think one of the things, it's been sort of a paradox for me uh, because I almost have to name the thing that I say I'm fighting against in order to, get to, to sort of gain attention to it. And what I mean by that, a lot of just like I told you, I have seven felony convictions, right? So I have to sort of put myself on display in a way to even sort of shine light on this when in actuality I'm, become, I'm, I'm getting to the realization that, you know, I think a lot of times when we go down these roads and we begin to talk about people as ex-cons and ex-felons and um, ex-prisoners and we use the language that has been given us to it. It's almost like, you know, what um, um, Andre Lloyd said about the master's tools. Like how we're going to break down the house when we're using their language to sort of break it down. And so, you know, one of the things that's sort of been near and dear to my heart is like, how do we even begin to think about this sort of the language of, 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 of the criminal justice system and particularly, in, you know, the prison industrial complex because I think that the two are so closely related. Um, and I'm just sort of, you know, I, need, I think we need to sort of challenge in, in terms of myself, I'm, I'm part of that challenge. And this is advocacy groups and people who are sort of doing what we call the good work that only sort of reify and recommodify the thing in which they're fighting against, you know? Because you keep giving it license. And, you know, if we look at, we know anything about prison and we know anything about why it is even here, it is, it is a moral judgment. And it is for the morally good to say, look, see, I'm doing something good. Look, see, these people are bad. And, you know, we keep living in that paradox then we're gonna and then and then we're gonna forever go down that road, um, and you know, and then it never erases the stain of incarceration. Once we continue to assign people those labels and even talk about them in that way, I mean, because for me, you know, I had to learn this. You know, when I first got out of prison, I used to be very, very, un you know, uncomfortable around people who I perceived who had been doing more than what I had been doing or was in a better situation than I was in. And I had to keep living a little bit longer to understand each person's narrative that no one is exempt from anything. And I've met more morally bankrupt and morally bad people that have, doesn't have one felony, but they're still the good. And so I don't buy that anymore about, you know, about this, about in terms of like, because someone's been incarcerated, they, you know, they have to be, they fit into that stereotype. Nor do I, do I buy into the fact that, you know, everybody that hasn't been locked up is good either. So I know we both know that's fallacy and that's, that's a lie. But if we continue to perpetuate and give license to it, then what are we fighting against? Because we, we never get rid of that, that thing. At some point, and that's going to come up, you know. Um, and, you know, we got to stop, stop looking at prison writing as a genre. How about it's just part of what the fuck we do? Excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that slipped. <laughs> you know, and um, yeah, one of the things, you know, because we, you know, it's, it's a sort of systemic thing, and you look at it in terms of life, we're all born, and the box is ready for us. 
gender, sex, race, everywhere we go. From the time that we don't even know how to spell, like it's being dictated in terms of what we have to do. And, whether, and, and, and as much as sometimes we fight against not being in the box, we still find ourselves in the box, right? And so I've never been, you know, I've been really trying to think about that in a lot of ways um, because how are we going to get past that when every time you turn on the TV and something happens, the first thing to do is like he's an ex-felon or he's an ex-convict. It just not going to go. It doesn't go away, and so that just re whether the person is is guilty or innocent is is beside the point. It's the language in which we begin to treat human beings is sort of what I'm after. Um, and so, with that said, I've been working on a couple of pieces. Um, I'm working on some poems that sort of like work to sort of dispel some of that. Let me see if I can find them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How about that? So I'll read a couple of them. That cool? All right. Let me know you're with me now. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Boop, boop, boop. Well, we go right here first. I don't think I can find the other one. Can I find it? Nope. Oh, here we go. All right. So, this is my play on their word, on their words, my definitions, a little satirical. Okay, convict. Sentence is criminal without a release, never ever, immoral, might be a appropriate, the con is the conviction, itself trickster for defendants who without sin is a juror, in the mirror a judge, on the bench, again all doppelgangers, interchangeable bodies declared guilty by those with guilt, a verdict within a paradox of secreted legal secrets, inescapable now held by ankle weights, waiting in forever quicksand, hypocrites who could be but are not deemed corrupt in a state within the statement, Sanctions with the X can never be a good thing. Label made legend by the original colonials. All right. <laughs> Felon. Assigned to bad people but not. Limited or this malice thing in cage habitat. A shady character. A cruel misnomer could be prison but ordinary people are cruel. Uncertain ethical character should be prerequisite, not a record. From medieval Latin, the evildoers, phalo, a delinquent, but not necessarily legal or the greatest lie ever. Told as stigma, meant as lifelong, after debt paid, all is never forgiven. Classification is, of course, without expiration. A fate, some say, loser or lifer, but what is lost, the evil, the moral good do in the open. All right. Um, incarcerate. Unable to resurrect from burnt ashes into confinement, a human, in change, detained against will or doing a bid, medieval as usual, in context, outdated punitive punishment, a constricted group on eternal lock, behind bars, incarceratus or set up under lock and key. A telescope zooming closer reveals how to define another word for catalog the chattel. Mark for deletion as habitual habitat, a birthmark that grows bigger with time is of no consequence to the key holders. Could be a split, life doesn't matter at all, much bigger than the new Jim Crow. I don't think y'all heard me. Don't just read the new Jim Crow and think you got it. I read the new Jim No, I love the new, I'm just saying. Make that be a starting point, but don't stop there. <laughs> anyway, so um, that was that. And so what I want to do next is that. Okay, don't worry about it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, and so um, what I'd like to do next, because I want to save some time for Trey, 
Tracy, Tracy, yeah. I'm gonna save some time for that. Um, I have one other series that I'm working on. Um, it's called The Unreliable Narrator. And we all know that people that's been incarcerated that has a felony on their record don't need to get on the witness stand. You just don't. Which I find kind of interesting. Um, when I was locked up, when I was, getting, when I was um, trying to get my motion, my sentence commuted, um, I remember the district attorney um, telling, the, telling the judge that Mr. Mr. Horton had, had 37 years to get his life together and he ain't done nothing in that time. He talked about me so bad, I didn't even know who the hell he was talking about, but he was talking about me, and he meant it. Um, and you know, what's interesting nowadays, I teach at the University of New Haven, which, uh, which has the, the, um, Dr. Henry Lee. Uh, for those of you who don't know, he worked on the OJ case, and he's one of the fathers of modern CSI and forensics all over the country, and so most of my students are coming to be on some part of the criminal justice system. All, most of all of them that I teach, especially my creative writing, that's mostly CJ majors. So I find it very interesting, you know, um, that, you know, that this guy had the, the gumption to say this, and you know, some days I wish I was teaching this kid, you know, I just do. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but you know, um, but anyway, and so, am I, you know, I, I think about that all the time, you know, here I am, you know, at this place where students come to sort of listen and think of me in this sort of this position. But if I get in front of the society or if I get up on the witness stand and talk about something that I see, that it becomes null and void, um, that it becomes, you know, like, when, does your, when do you outrun your past or do you, out, do you, do, or do you not? And so um, even when people do good things, um, they never outrun that. Uh, it's never, our, it's always a question. And, you know, why is it just a question with this when we don't question other people who are about, question, you know, shady things in their lives, but they get to operate in impunity. And I sort of find that kind of jacked up, but whatever. Um, so let's see what we got here. So there's a series called Unreliable Narrator, and they talk about different things. And so let's give it a whirl, see where we're at. All right. The unreliable narrator, the real. Nothing symbolic here, okay? Dark is dark, cage is cage, hunted and hunter are both taken in the literal. Make believe in what ifs do not exist, a lie. Nothing cryptic here, okay? Rape is rape, pray must pray. No TikTok in the future safe from the quiet insertion of a shank wrapped in masking tape, okay? Nothing here infinite. Only time doubles over, it's constant. The merciful and the merciless, one, the same, okay? There are no allegories to hide behind. He slid his wrist, mean he slid his wrist, okay? All right. And so part of what I wanna to do too is sort of highlight books, uh, pieces of literature that actually talk about incarceration, the prison industrial complex in some kind of way. And I'm trying to weave them into the, the stories that I, I talk about or the narratives that I sort of try to talk about. Um, and this one, uh, I don't know if anybody familiar with Miguel Pinero's play Short Eyes. Yeah, yeah, and so it's, I love that. I mean, I love the play and I love it for a lot of reasons, but uh, uh, this one um, sort of like riffs off Short Eyes, right? The unreliable narrator report from the inside. Anything can be destroyed, for the non-believers cupcake was deflowered one night after count time. Clearly the structure glows obsolete by legal order, and I sit in darkness all day expected to dictate wrongs, a witness to nothing on the stand but in fine print, forget guilt or innocence, but it cannot be forgotten. A report from the inside, irony or ironical, ironical Writings on what plainly has been prescripted as identical to the blueprint forgotten within the penal frame. You can't see the backdraft's flashpoint, a raging fire. This suicide must be. I must commit to killing the eye in order to save a self. There is no logical recourse. Catty corner, un catty corner under the door it arrives sometime. One act staple at a time. 
Short Eye, the play slid on the cold cement from cell to cell. Miguel Pinheiro is perhaps the only one who ever gave us us. I write society flip upside down. Imagine that. Color two, this death, only a beginning of what you knew. Come sit in the political madness alongside the bad. Perception versus the real occurs quite quick. Or, or of course, it's real, recording human violation. All right. The unreliable narrator, or this malice thing, this malice thing, which sort of riff off of Nietzsche's um, the genealogy, of, the genealogy of morals, when he talks about the good and the bad, and sort of the malice being this sort of dark thing in which the good sort of measure themselves against. So, anyway, this malice thing. Okay, there's a cell with one window just before day. Don's early demise magnifies a metal toilet. The cool water cooling two can sodas, each wall a slab of gray cinder block, no posters featuring eroticized women with an ex exclusive in black tail, okay? The wall that slits the light does not reveal nothing new ever. The expose, the changing same, a holding. One window offers the gateway. My face pressed against the window and time rules this empire. Okay, the mind held hostage by time. Mind and body conjoined twins. The other wall holds a frame. The frame holds a metal door to contain the belief of the visible. Walls are gray, not like summer, but darker. Yes, there is darkness, okay? A never ending. give you two more of these and we can sort of, um, and let's see. And so one of the things I'm interested in, uh, do I have it? Uh, I may not, but that's okay. Uh, I don't have it. Um, one of the things I'm interested in though is the idea of what Michael Foucault talks about um, in terms of like the way we look at prison now. It used to be this, this whole physical torture you know, uh, in, in the myriad ways in which you know, that, that, that sort of occurred. But now everything is hidden. Um, and just like Michelle Alexander says, sort of the hidden structure, but also sort of like the idea of like what it means in terms of, you know, abuse. Uh, and it's more mental now. And so it's sort of, a, it's sort of games with the mind. Um, and so I think we need to be cognizant of that at all times when we're sort of talking about you know, things that happen on the inside. Um, let's see. Okay. The unreliable narrator, blame the blameless. Distractions ring apparent, gate, iron, cement, gun, dog, division by categorization. Race is a factor also manipulated because you cannot depend on reflected frisk fights inside the dome of the incarcerated. This may be make-believe now. A row of cells contain bushes, warm drugs, the carnage invisible within a sentence. Brought in by corrections from Baltimore, bundles of boy are opiates for the ignorant. Hung out to dry while hanging in the streets for melanin bodies. Prison prescribed as cure. Blame shackles for diversions, for the system goes blameless. Cop warden, DA, politician, all say necessity, a must, a need. This is the fantastical dreamed up in the mind of someone real. All right. All right. I'm going to close with this one. And it sort of riffs off of um, two things. Uh, Dante, well, actually three. Uh, Dante's Inferno, which um, begins with a thing, quote, called For the Good of the People. And this poet named Robert Duncan, um, who also said the same thing um, in a book called Orders. And then it riffs off of uh, um, George Jackson, the Soledad brother, um, uh, on the quote from him, right? And so, like I say, one of the things is, is to sort of like have this larger conversation with those who have written about these things in some kind of way. And that's sort of one of my larger goals as well. 
the unreliable narrator, don't trust the process. <laughs> wait and waiting and wait. Naked, stand before God, you are now invisible, would not materialize through iron nor the ignorant, nothing changes, nothing. Intake, property, and medical, each take a piece of humanity, each destination a moral point, converging towards a cell, hidden in the axiom by a lie. No one really gazes unless given a grand tour, be your hands handcuffed to hard plastic, behind the back pool tight, no money, no phone call, no bail, product for expenditure or process as prosecution. For the good of the people, Dante and Duncan said, the most abused of an unrighteous order, wrote the Soledad brother, good people do not reside here. Screaming in a dark ocean, the body is not constitutional, becomes more effective than saying, this shit ain't right. All right. And so I'm gonna end right here and let Tracy come up and maybe we can have a conversation, but thank you guys for listening and, and bearing with me. I think the last time that we sat like this and had a conversation about your writing was in Harlem. Yeah. And like a, a hookah spot or something. Yeah, like that. <laughs> but we saw you the mocha lounge, right? <laughs> right, absolutely. Just sitting down like, hey, I know you. Hey, that's <laughs> anyway. right. Yeah. That's right. So, um, there's so much to say, but before we jump right into um, thinking about what Randall has uh, laid on us, um, really, as we think about the intersection of uh, creative writing, um, poetry, um, and thinking about detention, right, and thinking, interrogating it, right? I think a lot about when you first started to speak, Randall, I was thinking mm -hmm. about um, Ngugi Wafiongo, who I had the opportunity to, um, the Kenya writer, who I had the opportunity to study with when I was in graduate school, um, he was detained and has experienced detention, a lot of times political detention, and uh, when he won a prize in 2016, he um, pronounced himself the language warrior, right? So mm -hmm. I thought a lot about Right. Not only your writing, but also all of the people that you are writing in the continuum of. Right. You talked about George Jackson, Etheridge Knight, um, so many others. But before we jump right into that, I just wanted to take a quick poll. Um, because every time I come to one of these sessions, I realize that we are in close community. And that many of us are working on a lot of the same issues. So I just wanted to do a quick poll of the audience and see how many of you are working at the intersection of um, the arts and examining incarceration or thinking about detention. Okay, absolutely. So, um, so we are um, in connection. How many of you um, come to it from the point of um, being an activist and thinking about being a community or human rights activist? How many of you arrive at that? How many of you come to the work as an artist? That is your, that's where you enter. How many of you um, come at it because you are, um, I think all of us may bear in this category, but your work, um, you seek in your work to challenge um, the carceral state? So this is a poll so we can see who each other is. I, I think a lot about um, something that Foucault said. I'm from that time when we were always, <laughs> so all of us were studying Foucault, uh, just to punish, there right? You go. <laughs> right, and what I'll just say is that um, uh, Foucault said, there is no glory in punishing, right? So that's one of the things that I think about, and you have um, evoked Audre Lorde many times, I think at least right. three, yeah. when I was counting your reading, and one of the yeah, things yeah. that Audre Lorde does when she writes a poem for Asada Shakur, um, you know, who was in detention and then fled to Cuba, um, she writes to her, I dream of your freedom as my victory, right? Mm -hmm. So when you were speaking, mm -hmm. I mean, I think there, and we're gonna be joined in a little bit by um, alumni of uh, Free Rights, uh, I wanted to kind of start there. I wanted to um, start there in your own journey to a certain type of freedom, a certain type of second life that you um, hinted at in terms of um, a writing life. Um, and not just a, 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 a doctor of writing, mm -hmm. really. Can you just talk a little bit about what your writing was like before North Carolina and, and, and a little bit about after and what Carolina did to you, North Carolina did right, to you? Right. Well, I mean, 
I wasn't writing. I didn't. I, I read because my mama made me read, um, and I didn't write. I didn't look at myself as a writer. I didn't know if that was even a possibility as something one could do. I mean, no one in my graduating class doesn't have done anything in the arts. I mean, like you know, filmmaker, writer, anything like that just wasn't viable. Uh, from coming from Birmingham, and you know, I was born in '61, so I graduated in '79. So I'm of this sort of that interesting time period. Uh, but, and even when I went to Howard, um, I necessarily wasn't even thinking about writing in that way. And so writing something definitely was something that came to me while I was inside. But it started before I even went to prison. Uh, I was in this program uh, in Montgomery County Detention Center in Maryland. Um, and there was this program called Jail Addiction Services. Uh, but it was a program to sort of, um, you go through the day and you would go through these different sessions. Um, but one of them was a was a, a session with a, um, a social worker who would have us writing these interesting essays. And she would give us these challenges to sort of write about the thing, the harm that you had caused others or um, you had, the, you know, the, the, the disappointment that you had created in your family and why and some of the things that you feel guilty about on the streets. And so we have to go back in our, in our cell at night and sort of write these things for the assignment um, for the next day. Um, and so one of the things I began to notice when I began to sort of write these, um, these sort of essays that um, I began to feel a little bit better about myself and I began to understand myself a little bit too, um, a little bit better about the things that sort of made me tick and I had never really done that. Um, but it was because of this, this, her name was Pat Park. I remember, I mean, I know her pretty well, even to today. Um, and she was like, encouraged me even when I got my time she called me in her office and she was like, one of the things you, you, you say, promise me that you won't stop writing. Mm. You know, because I think you have something to give. I think you really have something to give. And no one ever told me that. So um, I had a lot of time on my hands. And so I figured, you know, I kept that mentality all the way to I was in prison. I had a, you know, so I had a, a routine, you know, I would wake up in the morning and I would hand write on a legal pad. And then in the afternoon, um, when we locked in, I would type. And so that was sort of my, you know, you know, write, edit, type, and so continue to continue to do those things. But in this book right here, um, there's actually some of those some of those writings appear um, um, when I'm talking about incarceration. So I actually you I've used I use some of those letters in there from the, from what I what I what I what I kept. But you know, it started sort of there, and then by the time I got to North Carolina, I had been in conversation with some writers. I wrote. I wrote, I wrote a lot of people, but the ones that wrote me back, Marita Golden wrote me back. Wow. Um, yeah. And Ethelbert Miller became a, a good friend. Um, uh, and and we, we developed a good correspondence. And he would give me, he, by the time I got to North Carolina, he, he was giving me books to read and telling me, you know, things I should be on the lookout for. Um, and so when I, when I got through, when I came back to Washington, that was what I was set out to do. And I didn't know what I was going to do with it because no one, I, I didn't know that one could actually make, you know, make a living in some kind of way mm -hmm. writing. That didn't, but, you know, what it was is that it made me feel good inside. Mm -hmm. What kept you going, though? Because there's, um, like Etheridge Knight, I think, who begins to write when he's um, in prison in mm -hmm. Indiana, mm -hmm. uh, there's a conversion that happens from you being... Um, creative and obviously talented and other people being able to spot that mm -hmm. um, to emerging some years later um, as a full-fledged writer right. who sees writing as a craft and is willing to take that journey, at least to start on that journey. Yeah, so, so you're asking me what... What, 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 what clipped? I don't know. I think when I went to Furious Flower, when I was, uh, which is a thing in the honor of Gwendolyn Brooks that happens at James Madison, is every 10 years. I missed the first one. I didn't know, you know, I, just, I didn't know who when the looks was even was. I got locked up. That's just where I was at. But the second one, uh, I went, and I went with a group from Howard. Um, I mean, from D.C. Uh, Tony Medina. Uh, Tony Medina uh, took a few of us down because I, had, I had begun to sort of slam. When I came back, I started slamming uh, for doing more performance. But even while I was doing that, I had somebody pull me to the side and say, yo, you need to get in the workshop with Tony Medina over there, man, because you're doing a lot of stuff unconsciously that I think that you could actually work on. And so I actually took his advice and went because Howard didn't let me back in. So anyway, I was in that whole workshop thing. We went down to, and so I got a chance to meet, you know, all of these 
writers that I had been reading about and begun to sort of create my own canon, uh, like Lucille Clifton, um, Nikki Giovanni, uh, Rita Dove, um, Amir Baraka, Amina Baraka. Um, it was just so many writers, man, and I was like, oh, wow. And that experience um, sort of solidified in terms of, the, and then, you know, I was down, I saw Haki, um, Haki Madhubuti, um, they're talking about the program here, mm -hmm. um, which was like- At CSU. At CSU at the time, um, which was the only program that sort of had a focus on African-American lit. Um, and being, being a writer and knowing I wanted to talk about you know, the black experience in some kind of way. I thought that that would help me out in terms of my, my progression. And so it was just like all of these things converged and I decided I was gonna come here. And how long had it been from the time that you had left detention to? Well, I, 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 left, I left North Carolina and I, and I graduated at UDC in 18 months. Mm -hmm. wow. So from the time I left there, it was 18 months. Um, and then I was right at CSU. And so for, you went directly from graduating from that program. Yeah, right into here. Wow. Yeah, I started. I started in this, in, this, in January, so it was like doing the middle, and then I left. And I, I finished here in eighteen months, and so yeah, I was. I got off my phone. You were on a mission. Well, I got a man on the front side. Man. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't missing nothing. Right. <laughs> so I can. Right. Back, I got that. So, <laughs> so you know, I mean, and so by the time I got to my P, you know, my PhD program. Um, which I kind of debated on going because my first book came out, mm -hmm. and I thought with well, the MFA, well, maybe I can get a job. But, you know, I didn't know, but I, you know, one of my mentors here, Sterling Plump, um, yes. well, that's my guy for real, and he was like, you know, you need to go get a PhD, um, just because of we saw the way that the landscape was changing within academia, but also, you know, I I got had seven felonies. I needed everything, I needed everything that I could cloak myself in. Um, to sort of make it happen. Yes. Believe it or not, though, as, when I started early in this process, academia is one of the few places that I believe I could actually get a job. And that might have been crazy or insane, but I don't know. My first, my first teaching came to an after school program here. I forget, I can't think of the name of it now, um, but they gave me my first chance right here, man. Um, it was an after school program I went into, I forget which school it was, and I would, I would actually teach. But you know, it went through a whole thing about getting me clearance. Um, right. Man, I had to get all these writers, man, and give me some letters of, 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 but it was cool though. And I ended up, um, and so the first time I ever taught someone was actually in Chicago. That's why I say a lot of good things happened to me here. My first book was sort of conceived and accepted while I was here. The program that I went through um, was great, but also the writers that I, that I met along the way um, had become sort of, you know, lifelong friends and uh, colleagues and people I sort of lean on, even to this day, so, mm -hmm. yeah. So, I wanted, um, you also talk, um, you reference um, the new Jim Crow, right? Mm -hmm. So you reference, um, you know, a really, really um, important work by uh, Michelle Alexander, and I thought that I would um, just read uh, just a, a minute of that, and then mm -hmm. invite up, um, our two guests from Free Rights, um, okay. just so that you can all sort of react to this idea. She says, uh, we could choose to be a nation that extends care, compassion, and concern to those who are locked up and locked out or headed for prison before they are old enough to vote. We could seek for them the same opportunities we seek for our own children. We could treat them like one of us. We could do that. Or we can choose to be a nation that shames and blames its most vulnerable, affixes badges of dishonor upon them at young ages, and then relegates them to a permanent second class status for life. And that, that latter, is the path we have chosen, and it leads to a familiar place. So I want to invite up both Walter and Cortez. I'm going to scoop over a bit. Yeah. Walter. Yeah. I want to take this opportunity just to um, acknowledge both Illinois Humanities and um, Free Rights for doing the work. I just want to say that. Please just join me in uh, recognizing the work. And so I'm going to pass the mic. I just um, want to, and I think that we may have um, time for just 
yeah, we're tight on time. So we, so we have time um, to just um, ask you maybe a question and then to open it up to, to everyone. Um, and so I just wanted to maybe ask you, maybe, maybe this is it. Uh, Walter and Cortez, can you tell us a little bit about yourselves and how you have been involved in the Free Rights Program? Um, <laughs> well, I think my thing in starting with the Free Right Program came when I was in the detention center and just working with Ryan and Elgin driving me crazy about my art and just getting it done. Um, like I asked Ryan if he could get like some turntables or whatever so I could like go back to the art I was doing before I had got incarcerated because I had been DJing like a few years beforehand. So I came back to the program a few weeks later and he had the whole thing set up. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up sitting and working with Elgin on a project that actually ended up selling at auction. And I got to see again last year, which was cool. And then just being able to get on the tables and practice that as well. So, I mean, it's, it was cool and like, it gave me a chance to use my time and not just do my time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Repeat the question again. Yeah, just tell us a little bit about you and how you became involved um, in free ride. Well, um, so uh, I met free ride inside the facility, but then I was released and. Um, I was on house arrest for about three months. Then I got, I got off house arrest and like, I ain't know what I was gonna do. But like one day I was in the Uber and I met Roz. <laughs> <laughs> and so like, I, ever since that day, like I, I've been working for Free Ride. And um, so, I mean, Free Free Ride gave me the opportunity to teach. Like they, they actually took me to um, Michigan. And, uh, in Michigan, I taught two classes of fifth graders. I taught them how to DJ. So, I mean, yeah, they they gave back. I mean, they, they helped me. They gave me an opportunity. And so, what's up? What's up? Yeah, so um, I'm gonna cheat here. For, I'm just gonna ask you one question. I'm gonna open it up for just one. So somebody needs to be teed up. I think we have time for one. I'm just really gonna cheat because it's, it's too good. Um, <laughs> I wanna ask the three of you, and this is like, has to be really quick. Um, I wanna ask the three of you about what the possibility or the opportunity or what is the secret sauce or the mix or the reverb that happens when art meets somebody who is facing time um, I'm just gonna stop there, we'll start with you, and then we're gonna go on to, to Randall and then to Cortez. Um, for me, it was a release. It was a chance for me to do like what I wanted to do, play what I wanted to play, and just have fun with it. It gave me that freedom when I ain't had nothing else. Yeah, I mean, for me, art became the conduit through which I could sort of talk about all the things that I couldn't express in everyday conversation. And so for me, that's what art does even to this day. Um, it helps me think through the world in which I live in. And I never adopted that philosophy until you know, I was forced to sort of look at, look at the narratives of, that I created in, the, in a different way. And maybe that's what I needed um, because, you know, now I'm so fully aware, you know, I'm always thinking like that, but if it wasn't for art, I would have never even noticed, noticed those things that are hidden right out in the open, you know? I mean, like, for me, like, it was just fun. Like, it was just something, like, to look forward to. Like, instead of looking forward to court days, like, I could just look forward to the, the next class session, like, because it was just fun, like, especially DJ. Just fun. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. So, 
Um, I'm gonna because you're holding the mic. Uh, no, no, no. You, can oh. you ask? We can get one question. I think all right. We have time for that, and then we have an opportunity to talk all the rest of the night amongst ourselves and with these amazing folks. But one question that you've been thinking about, perhaps. I know y'all got some questions. <laughs> Let's stop all that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's see. Can you just stand up and do these? I have a big voice. voice. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes. 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 All right. My name is Jonathan. I work for Circles and Ciphers, and we're part of the Vision and Justice, you know, program. Yes. Thank you. I wanted to ask you all, like, um, you know, throughout your lives, what was missing? That would have made a difference, you know, in your life if you had it. That would have had you steer clear of the, you know, of having the experience of being incarcerated. You know, minus the walking by black kind of thing. <laughs> no, I get it. I mean, it's interesting that you answer that question because every time I go somewhere um, and read, especially um, in places where there aren't that many people of color, um, I usually get some a handful of questions about you know, the presumption of like how I grew up, mm -hmm. you know, and so, you know, the truth be told, you know, I mean, it, I don't know what could have been done. You know, I had two parents, I had a father that was there, both my parents were educators, teachers. I should have known better, right? Um, and I've had, that's what I'm saying, so you, it, I can't look back and say that anything was sort of mission in my childhood that it sort of would have, it was just a constant decision. You know, I know why I made my decisions. It was, it was sort of more so geared toward, and that's no excuse, but you know, growing up in Birmingham, uh, doing the 60s, you know, going to sort of mostly all, you know, I didn't, do, I didn't go to school with anybody of any color but black. Just didn't, you know what I mean? I just didn't, and so I didn't know what that whole multicultural experience, I don't know what that meant until I left. I didn't have one. So you know, I look, I look at I looked at my you know my plight through this sort of lenses of, of of black and white, and also some of the things in which you know um, the obstacles that I sort of faced, and I wanted to cheat, I wanted to cheat my fate, and so I looked at selling drugs as a way to say f you to society, like I don't need your rules. That's what it was. It wasn't. I can't I can't blame it on anything, but everybody's case is different. You see what I'm saying? And so. It's, and so, you know, it's, for me, it's hard to sort of make those determinations about, because, you, know, you know, my mom and dad used to ask the question all the time, what could we have done? I'm like, you couldn't have done nothing. I was destined to do that. That's what's going to happen, whether I've been wherever, whatever, whatever. It was going to happen. I made those choices. And so at some point, you know, instead of me looking for somebody to blame for why I did what I did, I just had to own up to it. I didn't mean to be presumptuous. No, 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 I know you didn't. No, no, I didn't. <laughs> I know, no, I didn't take it. I promise you I didn't take it that way. I'm just saying in terms of like how, in, in, in the larger context of things, um, that that does occur. But I didn't take that at, like that at all. Um, and to answer your question is, so I was trying to also answer the question in that, I don't know, maybe be more accountable, but I keep going over it. That's the one thing I go over a lot, like what could have changed? I don't know. Um, I think uh, I think the best possibility would probably be just having my father in my life. Cause I mean, up until I was nine, I was a military brat. And then dad left to Hawaii. After that, I haven't really. Well, he up here now. We're going to have a drink Friday, but. I mean, if he was here during the period that everything was going on and it was just hard, like mom worked for CPS, so throughout the day she was gone, and then it didn't make it any better, like going to the school that she worked at, because kids are trying to pick, but I mean, I couldn't do it. Like mom would end up in a lot of trouble, more often than not, because I get into fights, and I mean, it's just... Like growing up, I didn't really pay attention to like what could have been lost. Like if she lost her job, what would we do? But I mean, yeah, just having my father there is that other side of stability. And 
just like instead of me having to step up and take care of my younger brothers and sisters and my two older sisters, whether they want to admit it or not. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it would have helped a lot just for me not to be so young trying to take on um, such a big role without really knowing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I say like just knowing the difference between like needs and wants. Because like, there's a lot of things that like you see and you want it. And then like you want it so much, it you almost feel like you need it. But like, you really don't need it. And like when you're young, like you don't realize you don't need it. And you just feel like you need it and you will go to any extent to get it. But yeah, I feel like just knowing that. That's good. That's good. Let's put our hands together for